Hi folks, uh, welcome back to part three. In this section, we are going to talk about quadratic equations and radical equations. Quadratic equations are equations uh, where you have an x squared term. So you might have an x squared plus x equals five. That's fine, but uh, the key word is quadratic. That means degree two. Radical means square root, uh, usually. So you might have something like square root of x equals x plus one. Um, and really, they're, they're kind of related. They're in the same section because what is a square root but the kind of opposite of an x squared. So uh, often they actually solve in a very similar way. Um, first, though, we're going to talk about quadratics, but quadratics that you might solve with an interesting tool. Um, and it's a tool I really like. It's a tool that students often forget about. And that is just the plain tool of taking the square root of both sides. So if you have an equation, there's a lot of things you're allowed to do. Uh, you can do anything you want to the left side and the right side. And that includes uh, take the square root of both sides. So instead of taking something that is complicated, let's go ahead and see if we can simplify this. I'm trying to solve for x. 5x squared equals 45. Isolate the x squared term. 45 over 5 is 9. Now, uh, what you can do is take the square root of both sides and we get that x is equal to uh, positive or negative 3. By the way, when you're taking the square root of a number, do be sure you include that plus or minus on there. Uh, so we talked earlier about the principal root rule that if I write on the page, me, the author, writes square root of 9, I mean 3. But if you're solving you're finding, jo uh, your job is to find both solutions plus or minus three. And technically, if you're watching along, we just looked at the definition of, of absolute value. Yeah, I want to talk about this a little more. Um, remember, from I don't even know when, p dot three, that actually the square root of x squared is not x, it's absolute value x. So really what I maybe should have written here is, all right, I did squared x squared equals 9, uh, squared 9, so absolute value x equals positive 3, and x should then be plus or minus 3. Maybe that's the missing step. I don't know. No one ever really writes it. We just go and say x is plus or minus 3. Not really related to quadratic solving. Um, what I'd say here is just don't forget that taking the square root of both sides is something you're allowed to do. Uh, let's see it in a different application. So here I have 3x plus 4 quantity squared equals 21. Here's what I see students do. I see folks go, oh, x plus 4 quantity squared. I know what to do with that, right? It's a parenthesis. Every time there's a parenthesis, that's the first thing in the order of operations that I always must do. So then this is 3 times x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals 21, and then you have to do 3 times 16, and I'm already bored. Don't do it this way. That's the fool's way. You're not just like asked to expand this, you're asked to solve for x. Um, so if you're asked to solve for x, go ahead and try to isolate the squared term. By the way, this is true because there's a single x here. If there's multiple x's going on, you might have to do that, multiply it out. But if there's just a single x, go ahead and isolate the x squared by dividing everything by 3. So then we get x plus 4 squared is equal to 21 over 3, which is 7. Now we take that square root of both sides. So uh, square root of both sides, x plus 4 should be the positive or negative square root of 7. Right, so this is don't forget your plus or minus again. Take away 4, and you should get that x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 7. Good final answer. Easy, three steps. I didn't even have to zoom out. If you are that person that multiplied everything out and you know had the 3 times x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals 21, the way you would have had to solve this in the end is to use the quadratic formula. How do I know that? Because I see that root 7 that usually only comes from a quadratic formula problem. So you would have made yourself uh, your work a lot, lot harder. 
Uh, try to avoid that if you can. If you have a single x, just look to isolate it, take the square root of both sides. Next move, solving quadratics by factoring. Uh, so factoring is wonderful. Uh, here is your, your main property. It's called, you maybe heard of it, the zero product property. And all terms of that are important. Uh, pro property says, if you have a times b, and it's equal to zero, not a, zero, then one of two things must be true. Either a must be zero or b must be zero. And what that lets you do is take a product and split it up into two equations. So that's how you get the two answers that you usually have in a quadratic, uh, by splitting up something that's a zero product. But what's really important is that that's only true if it's equal to zero. There's not like a two product property, it doesn't exist. It's a special property of the number zero. So it's not fair to solve this guy, going back to the problem that I wanna do. It is not fair to try to solve that by uh, splitting it up right away. Instead, you have to first, first get everything equal to zero. So I'll add 11x to both sides and I'll add 10 to both sides. Now that you have something like x squared plus 11x plus 10 equals zero, you can use the zero product property because you're equal to zero. Factor this out. Uh, so how about x plus 10, x plus one. And then looking at the zero product property, you can maybe get to the end from here, but the property says, okay, either x plus 10, equals zero or x plus one equals zero. And you can solve each of those to get that x is negative 10 or x is negative one. And there's your answer. So that's how you solve a quadratic by factoring. You've probably done this before, just a little quick review of all the properties, but that the main error I see math four students make is either uh, not being confident in their factoring sometimes, but most often, forgetting to isolate all the terms and get the thing equal to zero before you factor. Speaking of that, here's another thing, and I'm gonna solve it properly, and then I'm gonna uh, talk to you about what you can't do. So to solve this properly, we do need to get this equal to zero. So I need to subtract 12x. Then I need to factor this. Uh, the greatest, least common multiple looks like three could come out and it looks like x could come out. So we'll factor out a three and an x, and then I should get an x minus uh, four. Zero product property says three x could be zero or x minus four could be zero. So x should be zero or x could be four. Two solutions, check them both, they both work right? Zero clearly works because zero equals zero. And four clearly works because three times 16 is equal to 12 times four. Is that true? Uh, yes. I guess they're both 48. So we have two solutions. Here's what everyone tries to do, and it's not legal. Almost everyone is going to look at this uh, and say, mm -hmm. seems too easy, and it is. Um, you can't do it. The reason that you can't do it in a quadratic situation is that it's just eliminating a possible solution. So when you're, you're doing that canceling, and often people do it that way, what you're really doing is like dividing by x and dividing by x. And I guess technically when you divide by x, you're adding a restriction that x can't be zero because you can't divide by zero. But the problem is, is that a solution is x equals zero. So you kind of divided that thing out. You got rid of an x that you shouldn't have divided by. You lost a solution. Um, and so it, it doesn't even matter necessarily the zero thing. Quadratics are going to have two solutions or uh, maybe like a repeated single solution. But dividing out a variable loses uh, we'll say uh, information. 
about that variable, right? We're trying to solve for x. You wouldn't want to just get rid of x. That you're, you're trying to, to figure out what it is. Uh, so that's why it doesn't work. You, it just doesn't. You don't get the uh, oh, there it is. You don't get the same answers. Uh, so you probably will get a lot of practice at factoring quadratics, and you've probably done it a lot before. So I'm not going to bore you with doing a lot more of those. Uh, instead, we're going to jump to the next method, which is completing the square. I love completing the square. Uh, I think it gets a bad rap because people don't understand it, but it's it's a really powerful, useful method. Uh, so I want to solve the quadratic x squ squared minus 2x minus 5 equals 0 by completing the square. Um, I look at this and I say, uh, do I want to factor it? Well, if I were to factor it, I'd be looking for factors of negative 5 that add to negative 2. And I, it seems like a problem because uh, I can't think of any such factors. There's only a couple factors to test, and none of them seem to work. So if factoring won't work, I could, of course, go to the quadratic formula, which we'll talk about next. But it can be better to do this method of completing the square, especially if your leading coefficient is 1. If it's not 1, it might be better to just go straight quadratic formula. But if your leading coefficient is 1, we're going to do this thing called completing the square. Uh, the goal of completing the square is to get a perfect square polynomial on one side of the equation and numbers on the other, so that we can take the square root nicely of both sides and solve. That's our goal. So how do we accomplish it? Um, step one is going to be to move all the constant terms. So I'll add five to both sides. Actually, one of them, I wrote that down because the most, a really common error I see is folks move that 5 without actually, like, moving it over so they make a negative 5 there or something. I've made that mistake a bunch of times. In this case, I'm adding it over. It should become positive 5. Then, and I left this lined up for a very important reason, I'm going to kind of make a little blank space here. I'm going to fill that blank space with any number I want. Um, right, I could put a 10 here. But if I'm going to add 10 there, I need to add the same number to the other side. And I really do like to, it's not required mathematically at all, but like kind of make those blank spaces just to say, okay, this is what I'm doing. Help me kind of keep track of myself. So what goes in here? Well, uh, there's something that will always work. Our goal is to make a perfect square. And to make a perfect square, we're going to take uh, the, not opposite B, I'm thinking of a different formula. Um, b divided by 2 and square it. In this particular case, it's negative 2 divided by 2 and squared, which is negative 1 squared, which is positive 1. So I'm going to add positive 1 to both sides of this equation. Why would I do that, you say? Well, because when you take b over 2 and square it, you should always get, always, always, a perfect square polynomial here. So move constants. 2. Add b over 2 squared to both sides. 3. Factor your new perfect square. Move that up. So this new perfect square now factors into x minus 1 whole quantity squared equals 6. We know how to solve this by taking the square root of both sides. I can notice that x minus 1 should be the positive or negative square root of 6. Add 1 to both sides, and I get, we'll go over here, x should be 1 plus or minus the square root of 6. And again, I noticed that we've got one of those answers that uh, looks like it came from the quadratic formula, which means that if you had used the quadratic formula on this instead, you'd have to do the whole thing and get, you wouldn't even, would not have even worked out nicely. So I think completing the square is a lot better method if your a is equal to 1. I even wrote down here, though, if a is not equal to 1, I'd recommend other methods. You can complete the square. You just have to divide the whole equation to make a be 1. But usually you get fractions, and then it, it, it's not as good. Um, OK, the last method is this thing that you've probably seen called the quadratic formula. 
and you probably I know you've seen it, but I just want to talk about it anyway. The quadratic formula is actually comes from a generalized form of completing the square. That is starting with ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero and doing the completing the square trick. We move the c to the other side, divide by a, that's where the c over a comes from, and so forth. In the end, we get x is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I've heard there are a number of uh, hilarious songs you can use to memorize this formula. If you so choose, I will not be singing them to you this day. Uh, one thing that's important in the quadratic formula is it does have to equal 0 first, so if I'm using the QF to solve this guy, I need to rewrite it in proper form. Now I can identify that A is 3, B is negative 6, and C is 1. So the quadratic formula should say uh, negative B is 6 plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC. That'll be 36 minus uh, 4 times 3 times 1, 12 over 2a, which is 6. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and reduce the root. So this is 6 plus or minus the square root. Uh, 36 minus 12 is 24 over 6. At this point, you might be saying, hey, that looks like a pretty good answer. I must be done. Here's the thing. You're not done. I would not accept that as a fully reduced answer. That may be, that'd be, I don't know, a 3 out of 4 points or something if we're talking points. Um, and this is, the, I think, the flaw of the quadratic formula is you have to keep going. You have to keep reducing. Uh, whenever you have this root, here, I'll write it smaller, it's important to reduce that root. So root 24 is the root of 4 times 6, so that's going to be the same as 2 root 6. Let's go ahead and substitute that in. So we have 6 plus or minus 2 root 6 over 6. A lot of 6s in this problem. And we need to keep going further from there as well. Uh, so remember with fractions that you can indeed split up each piece. So 6 over, so this could be written as 6 over 6 plus or minus 2 root 6 over 6. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. That's going to be the same as 1 plus or minus uh, 1 root 6 over 3. That would be a good simplified final answer. 1 plus or minus root 6 over 3. That is an irrational number. I don't know what it is. Um, but everything else there uh, is, is nice and beautiful. So that's your use of the quadratic formula. I want to talk about something called the discriminant. It's not a super important thing, but it's something that you can look at uh, to tell you how many solutions you're expecting. So notice that in this problem, I had two solutions, right? One plus and one minus um, that six root three. But you can also have one solution or even no solutions, depending on what happens under this square root. So the discriminant is just the piece under the square root. And it's something you can calculate ahead of time. So in this case, the discriminant of our equation was 24. When my discriminant was positive 24, I ended up with a plus or minus square root. And so I ended up with two solutions. So if uh, b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0, you're always going to have two solutions. If b squared minus 4ac, on the other hand, is equal to 0, you're going to be doing plus or minus 0. So you're going to have just a single solution. And if b squared minus 4ac is less than 0, well, then you're doing something like taking the square root of a negative 24 or something. You're going to have no solutions. So that can be a really quick check for the kind of solutions you're supposed to have. 
Um, I don't really use it in factoring, but I do use it a lot in graphing because a quadratic with two solutions looks like this. A quadratic with one solution looks like this. And a quadratic with no solutions looks like this. And so if I've got a graph, I think, oh, I want to be really sure about my graph. Let me check that discriminant. And it can tell me if the number of intercepts on the graph matches with the number of solutions that I think I should have. So that's one good use for the discriminant. Um, another thing that comes up is I think in math three, you guys learn about determinants. That's a word that is about matrices that tells you if a matrix is invertible, blah, 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 blah. It's not the same. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of strange uh, words that sound really similar in mathematics. So I just want to straighten that out. That's quadratics with the quadratic formula. So uh, at some point then, uh, I think it's even in the homework problems, it starts to say, use any solution, use any method you want. I'm a big believer in uh, using any method you want. I hope that this has brought you some strategies that you can use, right? There are times when it is much more efficient to complete the square. There are other times where it's more efficient to factor. And there are times when the uh, coefficients are just so scary and nasty that it is actually fastest to use that, that beast of a quadratic formula. A good problem solver that's well prepared will have all three or four methods at their, at their fingertips ready to do at any time. I wanted to share this quick example of a quadratic and how you might solve it. And you say, Mr. Eck, that's not a quadratic. That's like a rational equation. Yeah, but let's see what happens when we try to solve it. So I have a lot of fractions and I always want to get rid of fractions. So I want to multiply both sides by the least common multiple of all denominators. Um, so the all denominators are x, x plus 3, and 4. So I want to multiply by 4, x, and x plus 3. And I have to do what I do to one side. I have to do to the other side. So let's see what happens. Distribute this whole, all three terms, so the first here, the x's will reduce out. So I would get 4 times 1 times x plus 3. Distribute this uh, whole thing to the second term. The x plus 3's will cancel out, and I will get 4x, 4 times x times 1. And on the other side, I'm going to distribute the 4x and x plus 3 here. The 4's will reduce out, and I should get x times x plus 3. Let's do a little simplifying. So as soon as you see that x squared, it actually means we're into quadratic town. We're working with a quadratic. So as soon as I see that, I'm going to make a goal of getting everything equal to 0 on one side. We'll go and uh, keep the x squared where it is and move everything else over. So I really am trying to solve the equation x squared minus 5x minus 12 is equal to 0. Let's see, so we could have three methods of solving this. You've solved quadratics before. Uh, factors of 12 that add to 5. 6 and 1 seems like that would work. So does this factor into x minus 6, x plus 1? I think it does. So then I should get x is equal to 6 or minus 1. However, there's something I really want to check, and it maybe won't run into here. But remember in the original, it wasn't a quadratic, it was a rational equation. So as soon as that you see that rational equation, there's a domain problem or a restriction. x should not be 0 and x should not be negative 3. If any of our solutions had equaled those numbers, we would have to throw them out as um, not in the domain. However, it looks like our solutions are different than our excluded values. So uh, we have two solutions to this quadratic. I'll leave it up to you to plug those in and check uh, that that works out, but I believe that it would. That example with the fractions was a really good example of quadratics showing up in a place you don't expect. And the last topic of the video 
radical equations is another place where quadratics show up where you don't expect them to. Um, so I want to say right ahead that when you're doing a radical equation, you know it's a radical equation because you see that little square root sign, you have to, every single time, check all your candidate solutions. It is possible when you're solving these equations to get answers that are not, uh, that appear like answers but do not function in the original. They don't satisfy the original equation. It's just something that happens. We'll maybe talk about why at the end. So say I have this equation, square root of 20 minus 8x equals x. Um, by the way, the square root again is written on the page, so you don't put a plus minus on it. The author intends for you to recognize this as the positive version of the square root. When you have that square root, you can get rid of it in one easy trick. All you have to do is square both sides. It's as easy as that. So, uh, right, you can divide both sides by, by a number. You can add a number to both sides. You can square both sides. It is important, though, that when you do it, you put like a, remember that you're squaring the entire side. I like to put big parentheses around that entire side to show what happens when I square it. All right, so when I square a square root, I just get what's underneath, the square root and the square uh, reduce out, and I get an x squared. Oh my gosh, it's another quadratic. Let's group everything else on one side, so 0 should equal x squared plus 8x minus 20. Oh, let's look to factor. Are there factors of negative 20 that add to 8? 3 and 8, no. 4 and 5, no. Hmm. Well, maybe this would be a good candidate for completing the square then. Let's go ahead and complete the square here. Uh, so if I'm going to complete the square, I personally just really like to move the x squared to the other side. So I'm going to, I'm not adding it over, I'm just flipping the equation. But I am going to move the 20 over by adding it there. Then I'm going to pick something to add to both sides. What am I going to add? I'm going to do 8 divided by 2 and square it. So I'm going to add 16 to both sides. So I should get, on this side it becomes x plus 4 squared equals 36. So x plus 4, there's a little more room, should equal positive or negative 6 if I square root both sides. Uh, so x is uh, 4, negative 4 plus or minus 6 needs more room. So x is negative 10 or positive 2. Good so far. By the way, negative 10 and positive 2 is telling me that I could have factored it into x plus 10, x minus 2, and I just had a brain fart and didn't remember how to factor. Now we have our two solutions, but it's really important to do the check step where we plug in both possible candidates and see what we get. So I'm going to plug in negative 10. We're going plugging into the original equation, by the way. Um, so we have uh, 20 minus 8 times negative 10. That's the same as 20 plus 80. Square root of 100 is equal to 10. And since I was supposed to equal originally x, and x was uh, negative 10, this has not worked, right? So wait, let me rewrite this, right? That should be true. However, this is positive 10, which is not equal to negative 10. Take a look at that. Uh, why is that positive 10? Well, because the principal root rule says that when there's a root on the page, you assume that's the positive version of that root. So uh, negative 10 is actually extraneous. And then it will probably happen that positive 2 works, but let's check it anyway. Is that 20 minus 8 times 2 equal to positive 2? Uh, well, let's see. So uh, 
that's 16. So square root of four is indeed equal to positive two. This is then two is the solution. Negative 10 is the extraneous solution. That check step, check step is really important. Technically what's happening here is you've raised the degree of the equation. Uh, by squaring it, you turn it into a quadratic. Quadratics often have more than one solution. And so you generated two solutions and it will happen that these solutions will be like, they'll almost work, except down to like a positive or negative thing uh, that happened when you squared both sides. So uh, that's the extraneous solution in action. It happens almost always with a rational equation. If it, you should always check because um, you'll usually get one. Uh, but then sometimes the solutions work as well. Okay, last example. Um, I want to talk about what to do and what not to do. So a lot of you might look at this and say, aha, Mr. Eck just told me what to do. I should square everything. So they might say, okay, square, square, square. Not allowed. When we say square both sides, what we mean is that you can square the entire side. Not each term, the entire side. So if I wanted to square both sides right now, I would have to put parentheses around each side and apply an exponent of two to both sides. On the right side, that's fine. That is just equal to one. But on the left, I would have to be doing x minus blah, blah, blah times x minus blah, 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 and distributing out all the terms. And at that point, you'll have made it a lot worse, not better. So that seems like the wrong approach. But you can still get away with squaring both sides. You just have to be smart about it. What I mean by that is that you must isolate the square root term, then square. But first, we got to isolate that term. I see this term is negative, so I'm going to move it to the other side, uh, and I'm going to so I'm going to add the square root term to both sides, and I'm going to take away one from both sides, and so I should get x minus one equals the square root of x plus 11. Now the root is isolated. You can square both sides. You still, by the way, have to put both sides in parens, apply that exponent of two and apply it correctly. So on the right side, this does become x plus 11. But on the left side, you do have to uh, multiply that out. It's a perfect square. x squared minus 2x uh, plus 1 is what you should get. Now you can solve it like a quadratic. So we'll uh, take away x and take away 11 from both sides and get x squared minus 3, x minus 10 equals 0. Factors of minus 10 that add to uh, negative 3. How about x minus 5 plus 2? Yeah. So x is equal to positive 5 or negative 2. But as we said before, let me make a little more space, we must complete the check step. When I squared both sides right here, I, I raised the degree and I made, uh, when you square things, it takes negatives and makes them positive, which was not something going on in the original. So let's plug everything in and see what happens. So we'll plug in five first. Five minus the square root of five plus 11, does that equal one? Yes, five minus four does equal one. That is a solution. However, let's uh, test the other one. We'll probably get some, some opposite action. Negative two minus the square root of negative two plus 11 equals one. Does that equal one? Well, we have negative two minus the square root of nine. Negative two minus three, does that equal one? No, because it equals minus five. And since minus 5 is not equal to 1, that is actually an extraneous solution. And you should mark it as such. There is only one real solution uh, or true solution to this equation, and it happens to be 5. Um, and I think I said this before, but I still want you to, to provide both possible solutions and then show why you've crossed one out. So that's actually a second step to fully complete the problem, I need to see that step. All right, folks, uh, thank you for watching. This has been uh, the third of three videos on quadratics. You have a lot of tools at your disposal. 
The best thing you can do now is just go forth and practice. Uh, let me know what questions you have, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time.